you never know if you're just buying snake oil with some of the stuff. If it's making a difference, is it actually better or is it different? Sometimes we look yeah. for distractions um, and excuses to not do the work. And the only thing that really matters is creating a volume of work, you know, creating that body of work and and spending less time being a hobbyist about the gear. You know, it's like, it is a hobby. I think gear can become a hobby and pull you away from your main work as a professional. You know, analog synths are great, but sometimes I went too deep down that rabbit hole and it was like, well, is that synth going to change everything and suddenly write hit songs for you? And probably not. So to, for me now, the most important thing is how can I leverage the gear that I already have and and make it more powerful? It's like, how can I use the arpeggiator and Ableton combined with my analog keyboards and to create new sounds and new combinations of the existing gear I have? So that's really important. It's very easy to go overboard layering stuff uh, and sometimes maybe as producers, we think that there are more layers than there are in the tracks that are out there. And it's when it's three layers and it's not eight. Uh, so I'm trying to reduce anything that's redundant and it's going to mask the frequencies. Uh, so you just got to go in and be brutal. And and if you mute it and you don't miss it, then get rid of it. What do you th feel like makes something catchy? Or what makes something a good hook? That... For me, it took a long time to, to realize this, but unresolved tension is the key. So when I try to find a melody that's really good, it can't, if there's a question, I don't want to answer that melody too easily and have it resolved too easily. I think Deadmau5 actually taught me that, where mm. it, you want there to be, if there's a loop, at the end of the loop, you want, you want it to repeat and not satisfy itself. So it can be a chord progression, it can be a melody, um, it might be a matter of using stable and unstable notes within the scale. Um, you know, the hook theory is really good for that, where you can see stable and unstable yeah. uh, notes. But just, you don't have to go super dry with music theory, but if the chord progression ends at home, back at the one, it's really boring. Even with lyrics, if they're, if they're easy rhymes, if they're too easy, they're going to just be a little too smooth and not, not stick in someone's head. So there mm. needs to be a little bit of grit in there. There needs to be something that slightly agitates the brain a little not not in an annoying way but i think if you look at all the earworms all the earworms and all the hooks that are effective there's something that jumps out and is unique but also uh yeah it doesn't doesn't satisfy the the tension and release completely it just satisfies it for a little bit and then it gets back to the the beginning of the loop so for me that's what i try to look for with melodies and also, if you can play it on the piano, so I have like a, a real piano, this nice little seven-year-old Steinway, and I'll go over, play the chord progression, sing it myself, and see how the cadence is feeling. Uh, and if it doesn't feel compelling there, it doesn't matter how good the, the sound design is or the presets, um, the chord voicings, if they're not addictive, then it's not going to work. I think it, it is worth investing in, in making songs that are as timeless as possible and that can be transformed and shifted as the times evolve. Like, are there any artists you often reference or any favorite um, mix downs you love? Man, there, I feel like the, the bar is raised so high right now with mix downs yeah. that I think Hardwell to me is the gold standard for getting everything to sound huge and crisp and, and have this bass presence. It's easy to lose bass. Like he was telling me he masters all the releases for revealed and he keeps them very consistent. I don't know how he does it, but he's just, his ears are so good. I don't know what it is with these Dutch guys. They just, it's part of the culture. They, they really help each other out. It's very collaborative, but their, I love their that. ears are so tuned um, and so fresh. I don't know how they do it, but I think it's probably I look at his mix downs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so I keep a folder. I have everything. I drag in a mixed in key. So I make sure I can compare the different keys to each other, the tempo, the key, those all make a big difference in the mix down. Um, but I think a lot of the, a lot of the Dutch producers to me are the gold standard. Um, and I try to listen to, you know, what makes sense for that genre. And so I have, I use wired masters. I have them do stem mastering for me. Uh, and I get it, I try to get to 80%, 90% there. And, and then I really need somebody to hear it with fresh ears. I think that's what you're paying for. It's not so much that I th it is easy to think that someone's going to come in and just fix all the, the shortcomings with your track. And, and you know, they're not going to go in and fix your side chains that are off or something that 
some latency issue or a bad hook, they, you know, they can only do so much. So I try to get as much done as I can in the mixing process. And then I, I um, outsource the, the, the last little bit, the last 20% or 10%. I think the mistake a lot of guys do, and I do as well, where I try to crunch, I used to try to just pull that threshold down on the limiter and the master and think that that's going to fix everything. And, <laughs> and just thinking like, oh yeah, I'll just put five dB of gain reduction at the end and it's just going to squash everything together nicely. And that's like the worst way to do it. So it's better mm. to do it with, the, with your buses, do some parallel compression, do some limiting, start to narrow the dynamic range on the tracks and the buses earlier in that signal flow. And everything's going to sound mm. a lot better. And you'll have, I think it's, you, you'll paint yourself into a corner on the master bus if I was going to give any tips to producers, like use Dropbox, use some sort of cloud service, use some physical media for backup, but every session bounce all your stems down. The plugins, you think they're going to load later on, but I, I would just assume that they won't. You know, I've been doing this 15, 20 years, and a lot of plugin companies go out of business. They get uh, acquired, they get merged, they go bankrupt. It's a, a lot of times the version, the name of the plugins are inconsistent and they won't load like especially autotune so mm. you know i actually worked i helped with the early versions of autotune and beta testing for them and they changed the and even with a isotope they they say it'll say ozone instead of isotope ozone or so the plugins yeah. won't load there's a lot of inconsistencies and i mean it's it sounds really detail focused but it's a problem if you load up those old sessions from 10 years ago and all your tuning is off and vocal sounds terrible <laughs> Oh, yeah, especially if you suddenly get a call from, like, I don't know, some big company and they want to license it for a multi-million dollar commercial. <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's yeah. great. I'll just open the session up and make those changes you asked for and nothing loads. And you know what's crazy, though, with stuff like Dropbox and backups, I, there's a really well-known producer who said he he lost four terabytes of all the sessions. This is like well, a major, he's like a headliner. And he said that he said he, he didn't do Dropbox because it could be hacked. I was like, well, would you rather have the chance of being hacked or having your sessions? I ran into him at the Apple store and he was trying to recover four terabytes because his, his uh, motherboard broke on his computer and they couldn't fix it. And I don't know if he ever recovered it, but oh, no. he was so paranoid about somebody hacking into his cloud account. Yeah, I want to ask you if you've ever heard any bad recommendations that you hear people say in our industry, what are things that our listeners should Ooh. avoid or not listen to? I got a good one that I have I've paid the price for, and I the the tip that I always heard was work in these boxes of frequencies and and just carve things out, carve out all that low end, and just just put a really steep high pass filter on it. I probably I probably have tips in the past that were like this, and I have to update them. Uh, <laughs> and the the idea is, you know, that to have these little frequency pockets to make everything fit, which seems like great advice, and in general. You just got to take that with a grain of salt. But the more you start hacking away at your audio and the more plugins you're putting on it um, and the more sharply you're EQing it, you're just creating more problems for it. And yeah. it's never going to, you just got to have to let there be these natural crossovers between frequency sections. And, you know, I would get obsessed over like high passing the reverb at 300 hertz and doing all this stuff. And you're losing a lot of information. So what I found out later on was I was thinning out my mixes. And I was losing, mm. I was losing a whole, a whole like second octave. I don't know if that's the second octave, the around hundred Hertz, 150 Hertz. I was losing a ton of the punch and yeah. yes, stuff can build up there and mud can build up, but, um, I would end up with these subby mixes with no punch. And mm. I just recently realized that this was a really bad habit I was doing and thinking that I was, you know, I was neglecting EQing the mids and just thinking, just high pass everything and keep the bassy stuff let the bass go through and it's not that simple. You know, mixing isn't just putting a high pass filter on there. So I think that's a common piece of advice, of bad advice you hear is just sort of chop things into these frequency blocks and everything will just fall into place. When in the past, I thought that working a 12 hour day was the standard and that you're going to do better work by working overtime, uh. which simply isn't true. And you really are, you be you kind of can become blind to what your song sounds like and you can undo your work and work backwards in your mix. I've worked backwards countless times and thinking, oh, I'm working hard, I'm maximizing my day, I've I'm in the zone. And you're really only 
to be honest, and most people will disagree with this, but you're probably only getting three or four good, really, really good musical hours in a day. It's honestly, like if you look at, there's a book that described the, the diaries of famous artists and musicians. And a lot of the most famous artists, they put the work in every day. They'll do their three or four hours and then they're like, I'm done. I'm going to go, you know, go for a walk or hike the rest of the day. And these are legendary writers and authors. And it's funny because you don't need those 12 hours. You, you're probably fooling yourself into thinking that you're maximizing your day. Um, I think you got to look for a natural resting point, a natural break point in the process. Uh, sometimes you don't always know and you get caught up in the excitement of the session. You're getting goosebumps. So I try, I take it as far as I can. And then when it feels like I'm forcing something, then it's time to take a break. 